Okay, so welcome to the next class of probability. So today um, we'll be discussing a bit of the central limit theorem. Okay, so central limit theorem, which is the next order, the next order of the law of large numbers. So next order approximation. Okay, um, but for this we're going to need, uh, we're going to need the characteristic function. function of a random variable. Okay, so um, before we had seen the generating function, here we are going to consider x a random variable and phi of t is going to be the expectation of e to the i t x. Okay, so where e to the i t uh, x is given by the cosine of t x plus i times the sine of t x. So Okay, so what are we, why are we doing this? Because uh, one of the points that we should note right away is that uh, the norm of e to the i t x, okay? So this is just the imaginary part, okay? So this thing can always be interpreted as e of the cosine t x plus i, the expectation of the sine of t x. Okay, so what is the interesting thing about this is that we don't need to even ask um, x to have uh, expectation for this to have expectation because cosine and sine are both uh, bounded functions. So cosine and sine are bounded functions and this is the real part And this is the complex, the imaginary part. Okay, so uh, if you're not used to looking at uh, something that looks like e to the i tx, just remember uh, this is always cosine of tx plus i sine of tx. And one of the properties that this has is that if we take the norm of e to the i tx, this is equal to 1 for every t and x. Okay, so because this is bounded, bounded, we have uh, we have that phi of t uh, is well defined for every t. for every t in r. Okay, and so uh, more generally this is not uh, for this class specifically but for other classes in general. So phi of t if x is a continuous random variable with density given by f, little f, then phi of t is going to be the Fourier transform of f at t, okay? So this is the Fourier transform. And how is this defined? Okay, so if we look at the expectation for a continuous random variable, so phi of t is equal to the expectation of 
e to the i t x. This is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e i t to the little x f x dx. Okay, and this is what we define by the Fourier transform. Sometimes uh, people actually put the normalizing factor of one over square root of two pi. Okay, but uh, we'll see why sometimes it's good to put this normalizing factor, but in general we can just take it like this. And this is the Fourier transform. Okay, so this is related to the Fourier series that you are used to seeing, and this encodes the whole uh, information of the function f. Okay, and let's try to see um, in which way this is true. Okay, so this is a theorem that people attribute to Bochner. That says the following. Uh, so, of course, x a random variable and phi uh, the characteristic function, the characteristic function, then a phi of zero. Uh, is equal to 1 and the modulus of phi of t is less or equal than 1 for every t b phi is uniformly continuous and c uh, for uh, values t1 through tn real and c1 through cn complex we have that the sum from i uh, the sum in i and the sum in j of phi of ti minus tj uh, times zi times cj conjugate is positive. X is a random variable where a phi uh, it's its characteristic function. Um, then a, b, and c, and the point of Wagner, uh, the theorem of Wagner, is that this is if and only if. Okay, so a characteristic function um, phi is a character function of some random variable if and only if you satisfy a, b, and c. Okay, so this is if and only if. Okay, so um, we'll just go with the the implication and not go back. But this is good for you to know in general. So the proof of implication of this way. Let's start with a. So phi of zero is equal to one. So what is phi of zero? Phi of zero is the expectation of e to the i zero x, but e to the i zero x is equal to one. So this is the expectation of one, and this is just equal to one. Uh, next, uh, so what happens if we take the modulus of phi of t? This is the modulus of the expectation. This is the modulus of the expectation of e to the i t x. But this is less or equal, and this is by Jensen's inequality. So Jensen's inequality works uh, for convex functions. So taking the convex function outside uh, is smaller than taking the convex function inside. So this is the expectation of e to the i t x, uh, but this, the norm of e to the i t x is equal to 1 uh, for every t and for every x, so this is uh, equal to the expectation of 1, which is equal to 1. Okay, that's part A. Uh, part B, that phi is uh, uniformly continuous, so let's consider phi of t plus h minus phi of t 
and take absolute value. This is equal to the expectation of e to the i t plus h x absolute value minus e uh, the expectation of e to the i t x. But now uh, using that the sum of uh, we can use the sum of expectations is the expectation of the sum. This is equal to the expectation in absolute value outside of e to the i t plus h x minus e to the i t x. Uh, but similar uh, to before, this is just the expectation. Okay, so now we can use the property of uh, the exponential uh, with respect to the sum to actually get that this is e to the i t x times e to the i h i h x minus 1 with the absolute values inside. So here we have used Jensen's for the inequality. So in particular this is equal so when we take the absolute values uh, the absolute value of i t x is equal to 1 so absolute value of e to the i t x is equal to 1 so in particular uh, the absolute value of the multiplication is the multiplication of the absolute values so all of this is just less or equal than the expectation of e to the i h x minus 1. Okay so the idea is that this here is a okay so this is a sequence of random variables okay so these are random variables and uh, one of the things that we can show is that uh, y of h is clearly converging to zero okay so what I'm defining by y of h is um, the absolute value of e i h x minus 1. Okay, so this is a family of random variables of random variables such that y of h is converging at h converges to 0 to 0 and moreover y of h is bounded by 2 for every h. Okay, and so here, uh, this is a theorem we haven't uh, actually covered in class. This is more of a real analysis theorem uh, that tells you that uh, we used it in one of the proofs before, so I'll just use it again. If, so, okay, so this would be theorem, which would be Lebesgue dominated convergence. the vector dominated convergence that says that um, let's assume that xn uh, converges to x uh, and yeah so it's even pointwise so it converges in some sense and uh, also modulus of xn is bounded by C with probability 1. Okay? Then, so let's even say in distribution. Uh, then, the expectation of Xn converges when n goes to infinity to the expectation of x. Okay, uh, I'm not going to ask for the theorem. This is a bit more advanced than this class, but the idea is that uh, assuming, showing that, so in general, so uh, just remark, in general, if xn converges to x, it does not imply that the expectation of Xn converges to the expectation of X. Okay, 
So this is not true in general, uh, and the only, and the way that you can, uh, okay, so there will be some examples of how you can check that this is not true in general, um, but the idea is that uh, the Lebesgue dominated convergence says that if you have some extra, uh, extra condition, then you actually get this property. Okay, so in particular, what we have is that then phi of t plus h minus phi of t is less or equal uh, than the expectation of yh, okay? And this is independent, dependent of t, okay? So that this is why this is uniformly continuous. And whenever we take h to zero, this goes to zero, okay? So this shows the continuity of phi of t, and it also shows uh, the uniform continuity because this bound, uh, which is going to zero, is independent from t. Okay, now for the third part, for part c, uh, what we have is that actually this sum of i and j of phi of ti minus tj is actually a perfect square, okay? So let's see this. So this uh, phi of ti minus tj, ci, cj, is equal to the expectation, okay? So you can put the sums inside the expectation, the sum over i of the sum over j of e to the i ti x zi, uh, times e to the minus i t j uh, x c j bar. Okay, so here what I have done is decompose uh, e to the i t i minus t j x into i t i x and minus t j x. And the idea is that this is exactly, this term inside is exactly what happens when you take uh, when you distribute the square, okay? So if you take the square of the sum, and here you're going to sum from k equals to 1 up to n, of e to the i t k x c k squared, okay? So if you take the square and you distribute the sum of this, what you're going to get is uh, you get the double, this double sum of each one of the terms where you have the conjugate, the uh, imaginary conjugate at the, each one of the numbers because we are dealing with this, uh, the norm of complex numbers. Okay, and now uh, to finish this, this is just positive because we are taking the expectation of something positive. This is bigger or equal than zero, okay? So a lot of these things are uh, using the properties of the exponential and that's the use of using this characteristic function is that you have the properties of the exponential going around to help you out. All right, uh, for the next thing. Okay, and all right, so the typical uh, result that we have been doing in this class is the following. Theorem. Um, if x comma y are independent, uh, are independent, then the characteristic function of the sum at t is equal to the product of the characteristics functions. Okay, and uh, what is the proof of this? So, uh, uh, the characteristic uh, function of the sum is gonna be the expectation of e to the i t x plus y, but now using the property of the exponential, this is the expectation 
of e to the i t x times e to the i t y, but this is equal by independence. To the expectation of e to the itx times the expectation of e to the ity. So this is just equal to phi x at t times phi y at t. Okay, and this is phi of x plus y at t. Of course, this is the type of property that we are going to use uh, when we are looking at the central limit here. Okay, so uh, that's uh, one of the properties. Another property is if we take um, phi, and I guess I will just not show this. So if we take phi of x over a at t, this is just equal to phi of x of t over a. Okay, so it's linear with respect to the products, uh, with respect to scalars, okay? And this just follows from looking at the formula. So another thing that is a bit harder to realize, but we sort of realize, uh, so uh, the next thing that we are going to check is the following. So what happens when we differentiate t8 at zero? Okay, so what happens? So if we do phi prime of t, this is going to be equal to the expectation. Okay, so this is, I'm not going to justify, but the idea is that you can justify it by using like Lebesgue dominated convergence theorems and these kind of things. Uh, this is the expectation uh, of, so this is the derivative in time, so the derivative with respect to t, of the expectation of e to the i t x. Um, okay, but if we differentiate uh, with respect to t, Okay, and so if we write it in terms, so this is the derivative with respect to t of e to the i t x f of x dx. Now if we differentiate with respect to t, this is just going to be i, uh, i times x e to the i t uh, x f of x dx, okay? So then for t equals to zero, we have the, the nice property that phi prime of zero is gonna be equal to i times x f of x dx, okay? But this here is the expectation of x, okay? So phi prime of zero is just equal to the expectation, i times the expectation of x. So similarly, similarly, we can keep differentiating to obtain uh, the case derivative of phi at t is i to the k, x to the k, e to the i t x, f of x dx. Uh, but this thing here, when we take phi k at zero, is just equal to i to the k, x to the k, f of x, dx. So in particular, this here is the expectation of x 
to the k. And okay, so whenever we differentiate, what we realize is that this this function here is bounded as long as okay, so this has unit one. So um, phi is k times differentiable with bounded with bounded derivatives as long as the expectation of x to the k so in absolute value let's say the expectation of x to the k is less than infinity. Okay, so uh, we can we can justify can justify these computations by Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem dominated convergence theorem. Uh, as long as e of x to the k is bounded. Okay, so we have k derivatives, we counted um, uh, k derivatives that are bounded, as long as we have the kth moment bounded. Okay, so this is what's the kth moment. So in particular, particular if uh, so in particular so this is now doing by doing a Taylor expansion by doing a Taylor expansion at zero we have that phi of t is approximately, or well, I mean, this is exactly equal if you write it correctly, the sum of j equals to zero up to k of the expectation of x to the j over j factorial um, e i t to the j plus a little o of t to the k if the expectation of the absolute value of x to the k is finite. Okay, so uh, this is by doing a Taylor expansion around zero. So if we have this, this implies that phi is in ck. So if phi is in ck, I actually can expand around zero and get this exact uh, form for it just by looking at this um, uh, just by looking at the derivatives at zero so what we can realize is that the kth uh, derivative at zero is just e to the x to the k so here what we are getting is the jth derivative at zero okay so this is a Taylor expansion okay so for k equal to one uh, we have that phi of t is equal to 1 plus, uh, this is uh, 1 plus e of x times uh, i t uh, over I, I factorial plus a little o of t. Okay, so this is for k equals to 1 and for k equals to 2 for k equals to 2 what we have is that phi of t is equal to 1 plus expectation of x times i t plus the expectation 
of x squared times uh, i t squared over 2. Okay, so this is minus plus little o of t squared. Uh, so this ends up being minus expectation of x squared times t squared plus little o of t. Okay, uh, so these are the two explicit expressions that uh, we are going to look at. So in general, I mean, it depends how the how the expectations, the moments of x blow up to actually be able to say something about the convergence of this series. Okay, so if k is equal to infinity, so this is similar similar to x bounded, so let's say that x is bounded by a, then phi of t is going to be equal to the sum of e of x j over j factorial times i t j uh, to the j. And this is j equals to 0 uh, to infinity. Okay, so this is an uh, this is an infinite series. So you need to look at it uh, to actually make sense of this. You need to look a bit at the radius of convergence. Okay, so the radius of convergence r has to is bigger than bigger or equal than one over a. So um, what am I trying to say here? So this is when we consider phi. So the this is for complex variables. So you need to start looking at uh, this phi as something that is going from C to C. And so the radius of convergence has to do with, so if I'm taking a Taylor expansion around zero, it has to do with the bigger uh, biggest circle in which I can claim that this is absolutely convergent, okay? So radius of convergence implies uh, uh, implies the series is absolutely convergent. So the nice thing about having absolutely convergent series is that we can differentiate inside and we can do a lot of things. So, um, yeah, this will be further on when you start looking at complex variables, but the idea is that you can actually start considering this uh, phi of t as complex variables, and then whatever trick you will learn from complex variables in terms of integration of them, uh, you can actually use them for this thing. And that's one of the main uh, points of the Fourier transform, is that you can actually use uh, different techniques at once. Okay, so what are the examples? So examples, uh, let's say that x is a Bernoulli variable uh, with parameter p. So uh, what happens with phi x of t? Again, this is just the expectation of e to the i t x. Okay, but if we're going to write everything down, this is going to be the expectation of cosine t x plus i times the expectation of sine t x. Uh, but the expectation of cosine tx, so the, the idea is that x is a Bernoulli variable uh, um, with value p, so this is equal to 1 minus p plus p times the cosine of t. Uh, this is for this first term, and this is plus i uh, sine of t times p. 
Okay, so and sine vanishes when x is equal to zero, so this part is equal to zero, and so we can rewrite this as just one minus p plus p times e to the i. Uh, sorry, i t. Okay, so you could just realize that you can take the expectation at this level, but if you prefer to go through the real parts and the imaginary part, there is not much of an issue. Okay, so how about for binomial distributions? So let's say x is binomial with parameters n and p. Okay, so what is phi of x? So the first thing that we know to realize is that then x can be written as the sum from i equals to 1 up to n of yi, where yi is distributed uh, with Bernoulli random variable uh, of parameter p and yi are independent and identically distributed. So phi of x is equal to the fam phi of yi, but what we have uh, said before is that the, the theorem that we had said if this, we have independent random variables, this, the characteristic function of the sum is the product of the characteristic functions. So this is equal to phi of uh, y1 or just phi of y at t to the n. But phi of y is what we calculated just before, which is 1 minus p plus p e to the it. So this is 1 minus p plus p times e to the it to the n. Okay, this one I can claim, can agree with you, it's not that enlightening that this is the characteristic function. Uh, but Let's keep going a bit more, and these ones will start becoming a bit better. So let's say that x is exponential with parameter lambda. So then uh, we need to take phi of x at t. Again, this is the expectation of e to the i t x. But this is just equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i t x times the density function for the exponential, which is lambda e to the minus lambda x dx. Okay, and so here you can be a little careful. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to do many complex integrations, uh, but the idea is that uh, one of the things that you can realize here is that you can rewrite this as lambda times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i t minus lambda x dx. Okay, so um, the derivative in x, so these things are fixed. So in particular, we know exactly what the, integ uh, what the integral, of this, um, integral of this function is. So the integral of this is going to be equal to lambda times e to the i t minus lambda x over i t minus lambda evaluated, okay? So evaluated of at x equals to zero, at x equals to infinity. Okay. So uh, we can actually justify doing this uh, exact thing if we know that when x is going to infinity, the term, uh, this term is going to zero. And this is actually going to zero because e to the i t x just has modulus one and e to the minus lambda x goes to zero, okay? So because the real, the real part of this number is negative, we can actually do this integration perfectly and get that this is just equal to lambda over i t minus lambda. Okay, so this is a nice function in the real axis, but it has uh, a singularity. This has a singularity, has a singularity at a 
t equals to minus i lambda. Okay, so let me try to show you something of complex variables. So we are in the complex plane. So this is the real part of a number and this is the imaginary axis. So uh, minus i lambda would be a point around here. And so what we're saying is that this function explodes around minus i lambda. Okay, so the function uh, phi of t is actually defined, so phi of t is defined everywhere except uh, minus i lambda. Okay, so we actually have a function which is defined for um, everywhere in C except i lambda. So, um, but one of the things that I am trying to say here is that this gives you a radius of convergence. So, uh, a function, a complex function which is differentiable uh, in the complex plane will, will have a radius of convergence of its uh, sum of its Taylor polynomial in the, in the biggest disk without singularities. Okay, so this is the biggest disk without singularities. So the biggest disk without singularities is this, and this R is the radius of convergence. Okay? Um, Anyways, so this is a complex function which can be thought of it in the whole uh, in the whole complex plane, and yeah, this is where things start like mixing up with other stuff. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you should not only look at this phi of t only in the real plane. We are going to use it only in the real plane, but you should start considering it as a function that is defined everywhere, and it could have some singularities somewhere. Okay. This is just a comment for people that are really interesting to understand how to do this thing. Okay, so uh, next we'll go to the most important example. So the normal distribution. So this is the most important example, which is the normal distribution and okay so what is phi of t phi of t is going to be again e to the i t x but this is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x times the mass function or the density function for uh, x so x is let's say n 0, 1, normal distributed uh, with mean 0 and uh, variance 1. So the in this case we have that the, the density function is e to the minus x squared over 2 over square root of 2 pi dx. Okay, so uh, what we're going to show in uh, in uh, so we're going to show it in two different ways. So uh, that this is actually equal to e to the minus t squared over 2. Okay, so then um, what's ha what we are going to realize is that this function is the same as this function. Okay, so up to the normalizing constant, so here we are only missing 1 over square root of 2 pi, which is what I said at the beginning of the class, that this is a normalizing constant that you could put. So this is the expectation of 1 over square root of 2 pi. So if we put the 1 over square root of 2 pi in, in front, what we get is that um, the um, characteristic function of the normal distribution is 
its density. Okay, so, okay, I'll forget about this. So the idea is that um, e to the minus the normal distribution, normal distribution is the unique uh, fixed point of the characteristic of the Fourier transform. Okay, and this is one of the main points of the Gaussian. Okay, so the normal distribution or Gaussian is the unique uh, is the unique uh, fixed point of the Fourier transform, which actually makes a big difference for a bunch of things. But the point is that it's really characterized uh, by this simple thing. So it has some special properties just because of this. Okay. So how do we show this? Okay. So how do we show this? Um, okay. There is a couple of ways. So one way is let's consider extending consider extending to the complex plane plane and we consider phi of i t so if we consider phi of i t this is 1 over square root of 2 pi the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the uh, if we consider phi i t, this would be e to the minus t x minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay, and here we complete the square. To notice that we do 1 over square root of 2 pi, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, if we complete the square, this is e to the minus x plus t squared over 2 dx, and then times, and I can put it on top, in front here, e to the minus uh, so here I'm putting t squared so, and here, uh, if this is i t, uh, here I would get e to the minus t squared over 2. Is that correct? Well, it depends where I put the i and t here. Anyways, so the idea is that then if you follow these calculations, you would get e to the minus uh, t squared over 2, which is uh, what we were trying to prove if we actually extend it to the complex plane. Uh, but the one that is a bit more followable than that idea is the following. What happens if we take the derivative in t? So what happens if we take phi prime of t? Phi prime of t is going to be the derivative with respect to t of 1 over square root of 2 pi of the integral of e to the i t x e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Um, But the idea is that, okay, sorry. So here you get e to the t squared. Anyways, that's my. Um, 
So uh, the derivative with respect to t of e to the i tx, e to the minus x squared uh, dx. Again, uh, if we can take this differentiation inside, and this can be done by the Le Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem, this is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi of i x e to the i t x e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay, and now uh, what we're going to do is the following. So we're going to group together this x with e to the minus x squared and do integration by parts. Okay, so this is equal to the, ident uh, the i times square root of 2 pi of the integral of e to the i t x times x e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay, and so what we're going to do now is integration by parts. So what we're consider is that this is du dx and this thing here is uh, v. It's a function v of x and this is du dx at x and sorry and this is actually the derivative of a function but this is actually minus the derivative of this function because the derivative and u so v is equal to e to the i t x and u is equal to e to the minus x squared over 2 but this is equal to uh, i over square root of 2 pi of the derivative in b with respect to x times uh, u dx so plus u times v evaluated at minus infinity and plus infinity okay so the idea is that this term vanishes because of e to the minus x squared over 2, which goes to 0 both at plus infinity and minus infinity. And then um, what we have here is that uh, here db of dx is equal to i t uh, is equal to i t e to the i t x and this term here is e to the minus x squared over 2. So if we put everything together this is going to be equal to i times i is equal to minus 1 so this is minus t over the square root of 2 pi of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. And now uh, what we realize is this is what we started with. This is phi of t. So what we have is that this is minus t times phi of t. So phi uh, prime of t is equal to minus t phi of t and phi of 0 is equal to 1. This is by the Bogner theorem. Okay, then uh, phi of t has to be equal to e to the minus t squared over 2. So how do you do uh, this? How do you solve this equation? This is uh, phi prime over phi is equal to t. So then this is equal to the logarithm of phi prime uh, is equal to t, so then integrating between 0 and an and arbitrary t, we get that this is the log of phi of t minus the log of phi of 0, which is equal to 0, is equal to t squared over 2. I'm sorry, there's a minus, there's a minus, minus t squared over 2. So then what we get is that phi of t is equal to minus t squared over 2. Okay, so this is another way of characterizing this exact distribution. Okay, so
why have we cared about so much about the generating function and the characteristic function? Okay, so the characteristic function encodes all the information of a random variable. Okay, so let's do a theorem that we're not going to prove and this is, this would be an inversion inversion which says that if x is a continuous random variable with density f then f of x which is equal to 1 over 2 pi the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus dx phi of t dx okay so if we have a uh, continuous random variable with density f, then f of x is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus i t x times phi of t. Okay, so then uh, we can recover, so the remark, or the idea is we can recover, recover um, the density function out of phi out of phi of x okay so in particular if we know the density function we know x if we know phi of x we know x okay so this is a slightly weird formula but the idea is that you can actually um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the characteristic functions and the f's and the densities for random variables. So uh, the next thing which is related to how we're going to use this with the um, with the limit theorems that we've been looking at is If xn uh, converges to x in distribution, then phi of n converges to phi pointwise. Okay, and conversely. If the limit when n goes to infinity of phi of n of t equals to phi of t exists and phi is continuous at t equals to zero, then there exists x, a random variable, uh, such that phi is its characteristic function, such that phi is its characteristic function, and xn converges in distribution to x. Okay, so convergence in distribution uh, of xn is equivalent to this, is almost equivalent to this pointwise convergence of their uh, characteristics functions. Okay, so then uh, what we can do is 
we can use we are I'm not going to give a proof of this theorem uh, we can use this theorem to get proofs to get a simple proof of the law of large numbers and the central limit here. Okay, so let's start with the weak law. So yet another proof of the weak law of large numbers. Okay, so we are going to assume that xi uh, are all distributed like x, which are independent and identically distributed. Uh, and such that the expectation of x is finite, then 1 over n of the sum from i equals to 1 up to n of xi converges in distribution to the expectation of x. Okay, so this is the law of large numbers. So what is the proof of this? Uh, the proof of this is we're going to take the generating function of this. So we're going to take the generating function of 1 over n sum i equals to 1 up to n of xi at t. Uh, but this is just equal to phi of t over n of the sum of xi, okay, so this is just if we take 1 over, uh, if we take a constant times a uh, random variable, the generating function is the same generating function at the constant multiplied by t, and then what we're going to use is that xi are in independent, so by independence, This is equal to, uh, by independence, we have that uh, this, the generating function of the sum is the product of the generating functions. So this is phi of x, t over n to the n. Okay? Uh, but one of the things that we have said is that for k equals to 1, so if expectation of x is finite, then phi x of t is equal to 1 plus i t expectation of x plus little o of t. Okay, this is for t uh, close to zero. So in particular, if we take phi x of t over n, then here we get t over n and uh, o of t over n. So um, for a fixed t, what we have, what we can uh, have is if we look at phi x t over n to the n, this is just going to be equal to 1 plus i t over n of the expectation of x plus little o of t over n to the n. And the idea is that when n goes to infinity, uh, this converges to uh, e to the i t e of x, which this is the generating function function of the constant 
random variable e of x. Okay, uh, so here uh, just to remind you how to take this limit and to infinity. Okay, so this finishes the proof. Okay, so this is a pretty uh, simple proof of how to do it. So you look at the behavior of um, the generating function around zero you actually write down what the uh, behavior has to do, then you take the nth power and then you look at the... Uh, you actually look at what the limit is and then you guess what is going to be the random variable out of this limit. Okay, so just a reminder, how do we do these limits? So the limit when n goes to infinity of 1 plus a t over n to the n is equal to e to the a t. Okay, and so here there is a, here there is a, a slight, um, uh, there is a slight noise by putting a, a little o of t over n, but the idea is that here you can put an o t over n and still get the same result. And how do you show that this limit is equal to this? So taking logs, taking log, what we get is that the we need to look at the limit when n goes to infinity of n times the log of 1 plus a t over n is equal to a times t. But in particular, What we can write is the log n times the log of 1 plus a t over n is equal to the log of 1 plus a t over n divided by 1 over n. And then by L'Hopital, so by uh, L'Hopital rule, uh, we can differentiate with respect to n uh, on top and bottom to get that this is equal to 1 over 1 plus a t divided by n and then here we would get minus a t divided by n squared over uh, minus 1 over n squared so then simplifying what we get is that this is a t over 1 plus a t over n. When n goes to infinity, this goes to a t, which is what we want to prove. Okay, so and you can actually do this in general uh, when there is a small perturbation to actually get the same limit. All right, you can do this via sandwich theorem to prove the general thing. Uh, the general limit use a sandwich version. Okay, so the idea is that you can create treat this as a small perturbation of this, so you can actually uh, bounded plus epsilon a t over n where epsilon uh, is arbitrarily small. Okay, so uh, we're going to finish this class with the central limit theorem. So what is the next order, next order of asymptotics? Okay. So what we have shown is that, okay, so Sn, which is the sum of Xi, I equals to 1 up to N, uh, is similar to N times the expectation of X. But now, what happens if we take Sn minus N times the expectation of X? Uh, the question is, how does this behave? Okay, and so uh, one guess would be that this behaves like n itself again, and so then I would have to divide by n to get something. But in fact, 
uh, this is not quite the case. And what we can say is that this guy behaves like square root of n. This guy behaves like square root of n if the variance of x is finite. Okay, so uh, the first order is to say that Sn is behaving like n times e to the x, which is the law of large numbers, okay? So this is law of large numbers. And the next order is to understand uh, how do we devi deviate from uh, the law of large numbers. So this is the, the experiment that I tried to do in class. So flipping the coin, flipping a coin n times, we expect n over 2 heads, uh, we expect n over 2 heads, but we can get arbitrarily, but we can get an arbitrary number of heads. So uh, we can get an arbitrary number of heads, but uh, what the central limit theorem is telling you is uh, you can be almost sure for large n, for really large n, the central limit theorem uh, tells you you should not expect, tells you shouldn't expect uh, more than n over 2 plus 2 square root of n heads or less than n over 2 minus 2 square root of n heads. Okay, so I mean for n really large, uh, this term starts becoming uh, much, much smaller in terms of um, n over 2. And so the idea is that at the limit when n goes to infinity, we are actually recovering some Gaussian behavior for the number of heads. Okay, so for large n, For large n, here we get the number of heads. Okay, so this is a zero number of heads. If this is n over 2 and this is n, the idea is that the behavior here is going to be okay, and the thing this becomes zero and zero. And this size of the change of concavity to uh, convexity is, so this point here is n over 2 plus square root of n, and the point here is n over 2 minus square root of n. Okay, and uh, the constants need to be adjusted a bit. Uh, but the idea is that if uh, in the first class I had the patience to actually make you flip the coin enough times, uh, what we would actually have seen is this Gaussian curve that behaves in this way. So the catch is you need n to be large. Okay, so what is the theorem? So anyways, if you want to play with a friend and you have a lot of patience, tell him, okay, I bet you that out of, uh, out of flipping a coin, we are going to land in this interval, you have a way bigger chance of winning than your friend. So that's, a, that's probably a good idea to actually try to make this bet if you get a chance. So, theorem, let's say central, central limit theorem. 
So let's say that xi is distributed uh, x and they are identically uh, distributed and independent uh, such that the expectation of x let's say is equal to mu and the variance of x is equal to sigma squared then Sn minus n times mu over the square root of n sigma squared is converging in distribution to the normal with zero one. Okay, so um, one of the things uh, I should talk about uh, remark here is that this is uh, universal. Comma. Uh, this limit, it is independent independent of x beyond uh, the mu and sigma squared. Okay, so it, it depends of the uh, mean and the variance. So, in particular, it doesn't matter what process we're taking. Matter what process we are considering. Everything averages out a Gaussian. Okay, and this is uh, really strong because, uh, for instance, in a network uh, or like when you have a, a problem with your connection, there will be uh, some process that is happening, but there is, a, a, at the end of the day, we always hear the same sound, which is a and this, uh, the distribution of that sound is given by the Gaussian. So the idea is that when you have problems in connections, when you have problems in corruption of data or this kind of stuff, what you would expect is that in the limit, uh, the loss of information of all of this is behaving like a Gaussian. Okay? So flipping a coin is, uh, has the same limit as any other complex process that you can think as long as we have a finite expectation and a finite variance. Okay, so what is the proof of this? The proof of this will be uh, basically the same as for the law of large numbers. So let's, for simplify, let's uh, think of yi, which is xi minus mu over sigma. This is all this distributed like y under iid, such that the expectation of y is equal to zero and the variance of y, okay, or the expectation of y squared is equal to 1. Okay, so we have normalized uh, x. So then uh, what do we know from this? By Taylor approximation, we have that uh, phi, the generating function for y, phi of y at t is going to be 1 minus 1 half t squared plus little o of t squared. Okay, this is by the Taylor approximation around 0. So, but in particular, now what we want to look is if we want to look at 1 over square root of n sigma squared of the sum of xi, i equals to 1, up to n, minus n times mu, this is just equal to 1 over square root of n of the sum from i equals to 1 up to n of yi. Okay, so looking at the distribution, uh, the general uh, characteristic function of this, and looking at the characteristic function of this is the same, so we can just look at the characteristic function of 1 over square root of n, the sum of i equals to 1 of yi 
at t. But again, uh, multiplying by a scalar is the same as taking the scalar inside. And this is the sum of yi. But now by independence, Uh, by independence, this is going to be equal to phi uh, y at t over square root of n, everything to the n. But now uh, this is just equal by the Taylor approximation of 1 minus 1 half of t squared over n plus little o of t squared over n to the n. And this is for every t small, but when we take n to infinity, so the same proof as for the law of large numbers, when we take this limit, this is just equal to e to the minus t squared over 2. But this is the generating function, which is the generating function of uh, a normal with zero variance and uh, with zero mean and unit variance. So in particular, what we have is that 1 over square root of n sigma squared of the sum of xi minus n times mu converges in distribution to a normal with zero mean and unit variance. Okay, and this is it for this class.